I will say that your core is only as strong as your feet are stable, right? So we want that. And then to take it even further, your glutes, everyone wants nice glutes, strong glutes, right? Your glutes are only as strong as your core is stable. So now we have this connection. So if you want, you know, the six pack abs, you really should be strengthening your feet. If you want a nice, tight, strong glute or backside, yes. you need strong, stable core. So when people understand that connection of the body, it really takes fitness and training to a different level. And it, it makes it much more integrated versus, okay, I'm doing my crunches and then I'm going to do my bicep curl. Like they start to realize this integration of the human body that when you start to integrate exercises, you're so much stronger. Welcome to Body Sculpt of New York, six weeks to fitness podcast, where we hope to inform, motivate, encourage, and inspire you towards living a healthier lifestyle. And now, here's your host, the president of Body Sculpt of New York, Vince Ferguson. Hi, I'm Vince Ferguson. Welcome to Six Weeks of Fitness, episode 204. Thank you so much for joining me today. Dr. Emily Splickle is a functional podiatrist and human movement specialist. She is the founder of EBFA Global, creator of the Barefoot Training Specialist Certification, author of Barefoot Strong, and CEO and founder of the Bolso Technology. With over 20 years in the fitness industry, Dr. Splickle has dedicated her medical career towards studying postural alignment and human movement as it relates to barefoot science, foot to core integration, and sensory integration. And here today on my Six Weeks to Fitness podcast to discuss foot awareness and barefoot training is Dr. Emily Splickle. Dr. Splickle, how are you today? I'm doing amazing. Thank you for having me on. Well, thank you so much for coming on my show. But before we talk about foot awareness, let's talk about Emily Splickle before she became Dr. Emily Splickle, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Yeah, I am actually from North Dakota. A lot of people often say they do not know anyone from North Dakota, so I'm the first person they know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I grew up there, very small town, um, but I was always very much into activities. I was a competitive gymnast from the age of six. So movement and really barefoot movement is just part of my identity, part of who I am and how I look at, you know, connection to our body is because it started from a very young age. And then from there, I actually went to um, college in Minnesota in forensics. So my background, even though it's medicine and fitness, oh. it was actually more like CSI and wow. forensics. That's what I wanted to do. Wow. Moved to New York City. I was in New York City for 20 years, actually moved to Arizona a year and a half ago absolutely loved living in New York City. And that's where I started my fitness career was uh, in crunch fitness <laughs> oh, no. down on 42nd and 8th. That was nice. where I started. Nice. Nice. Wow. So what motivated you to become a doctor? Yeah. So when I was in fitness, I did both personal training and group exercise. I actually love group fitness. There's something very energizing. I feel like as much as I would give to the, to the members or to the people in my classes, they were actually feeding my soul so much more. Like I would just leave every class I taught so energized. Yeah. So teaching so many classes and doing the exercises yourself, I started to break down my body. I was getting massive, you know, hip bursitis, severe knee pain, and was constantly in the physical therapy office. And I was like, I can, as much as I love fitness and teaching classes, my body doesn't have that longevity in it because of being a competitive gymnast for so long. I think I just was tapping out my body. So then that's why I started looking at graduate school and medical school is how can I combine my passion for movement and fitness, still stay within fitness, but then have this different degree that doesn't require me to use my body as kind of the, the tool for my profession. Mm -hmm. That's how I got into it. Wow, but out of all the areas of medicine that you could have gone into, you went into podiatry, okay? And what was the reason for that? I don't know. Um, I don't know if you said Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the honest truth is that I was living in New York. 
absolutely love New York. It was speaking to my soul at that time. Great, thank you. Got into fitness. It was the second thing that was speaking to my soul. And I felt at home in New York and I felt at home in the gym and doing fitness. So when I was looking at medical schools and graduate school, there is a podiatry school on 124th Street and Park, NYCPM, or the New York College of Podiatric Medicine. And I got accepted into that program. And it allowed me to stay in New York and stay within fitness. So those were kind of my requirements. One, I didn't realize really what I was getting into. And initially I was like, ah, feet. Like <laughs> I have to deal with feet every day. Yes. But then I actually started to connect it and create this niche and expanded really the way that I look at movement and fitness from this completely different perspective. So in my opinion now, in hindsight, it was the best decision that I ever did and opened up my career and this way that I help people move better and stay healthy in a way that I don't think I would have been able to if I've been a chiropractor or a physical therapist or not so specialized as I am now. Hmm. Now, when, when you talk about podiatry, some people get it mixed up with um, orthopedists. What's the difference between an orthopedist and a podiatrist? So podiatrist is, it's a different degree. So we're both doctors. Right. A podiatrist is a DPM or a doctor of podiatric medicine. It's four years of medical school, mm -hmm. three years of surgical residency. An orthopedist is an MD or a DO, we'll just say MD right now. So a medical doctor that goes to traditional medical school for four years, and then they specialize in orthopedics, and then they specialize even further into foot and ankle orthopedics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your specialty is foot, foot and ankle. Foot and ankle, slightly different training than an orthopedist because we do, you know, the orthotics, uh, a lot of the vascular and wound care, neuropathies. So it's really all, um, all, categories of the body from circulatory, neurological, dermatological, all of that with the feet, where an orthopedist really is focused on the joints, the muscles, the tendons of the foot. So we okay. can capture much more. I see, but you also uh, do surgeries, correct? Uh, podiatrists do. Podiatr yes. Podiatrists do. I was trained as a surgeon. I did surgery for five years. Mm. And then five years ago, I left surgery I often say I put my scalpel down for the last time, uh -huh. and now I do functional podiatry. So I look at functional movement, functional medicine. I'm trying to help people optimize the way that they connect to their body, the way that the foot influences how we walk and our balance so that we don't fall. So I try to take this much more functional approach with patients versus a surgical approach. Hmm, nice. Now, I read a quote on your site. It was um, from Thomas Edison. It said, um, the doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, diet, and the cause and prevention of disease. That is awesome. Do you believe that? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. I'm, I'm very much into preventive medicine being preactive versus reactive. Uh, I noticed a lot within kind of traditional Western healthcare or medicine is very reactive and fear-based. And I want to be more focused on preactive education. I feel that people, the more educated they are and the more empowered they are, they then take ownership of their body. They take ownership of their health and they then start to make healthy choices to then fall under preventive medicine versus reactive medicine. Hmm. Do you have any um, Eastern medicine influences in your practice, what you do? So I recommend a lot of body work, reflexology, um, very much into red light therapy, meditation, uh, acupuncture. So all of those, I don't do them necessarily myself to the patient, like acupuncture, I'm not trained in it, but I will refer my patients to acupuncturists, knowing that there is a great benefit, not just to the 
connective tissue, but also the energy and the meridians. I'm very much into balancing emotional states, what stress does, what fear responses do to the body and our healing response. Yes. And most of the patients that I see actually have chronic pain or chronic movement dysfunction or disorders. Mm -hmm. So that chronic component always has an emotional layer to it that I need to factor in. And that's really Eastern medicine is great for emotional complexities that come into our healthcare. Now, what about, do you, do you speak on diet at all? Very much so. And when I, when I look at diet, my concern is really inflammation. So I want to make sure that people are not having high inflammatory diets yes. because from a, a, a foot perspective, as our inflammation goes up or our acidity, it starts to make the nerves, the nerves in our feet and our hands start to become inflamed or buzz or vibrate. It just kind of changes their harmony, if you want to say. Yes. And then that can lead to a lot of idiopathic neuropathies, neuritis, uh, restless leg syndrome, different things that people may experience can be associated with high inflammation in our diet. Huh. Because I know most podiat podiatrists don't talk about diet when it comes to, you know, your, your feet. So that's something right away you're, you're not going to get from the traditional Western medicine, right? Yeah. That's why you're, you're basically uh, unique in that regard. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to be holistic and integrated in my approach. And if I'm not a specialist in something, I have a team surrounding me that I would refer someone to who would be able to explore it further, like an actual functional medicine doctor who can test your blood, test your gut, um, you know, see what vitamins you are uh, low on, or do you process vitamins a certain way? Certain people don't realize that they might be taking a supplement, but because of their body and their chemistry, they don't process those supplements well. So they need a different form of a supplement. And that's really how functional medicine works its way into preventive healthcare. Wow. Nice. Nice. What are some of the common foot injury um, issues that you see in your practice? I mean, the big ones, of course, are going to be plantar fasciitis, bunions, hammer toes, neuromas, uh, a lot of neuropathies, overpronation. Mm. So it's really, I would say you kind of, kind of categorize a lot of them as these chronic conditions that are resulting from foot weakness or from a disconnect or a lack of awareness of the foot. And oftentimes the lack of awareness of our feet is because of shoes or there's just not education around the importance of the feet that is prioritized within the healthcare system and healthcare education that people don't know what they don't know, right? So yes, they right. then won't go to a podiatrist or think about their feet until they experience foot pain. And yes. that's actually not how we want to do it. We want to be thinking about preventive, strengthen your feet, release your feet, think about your shoes, do exercises for your feet. So you are then again, prioritizing it. Um, the best analogy I give is like brushing your teeth, right? The way that we have made um, oral health care is very prioritized because of the dental association right. <laughs> is pushed so that there's education around it and people understand, okay, I need to floss every day. I need to brush my teeth so that when I go to the dentist, it's not them trying to reverse all the damage of neglect of yes. the teeth, right? Similar with the feet is I want people releasing the feet every day, you know, roll your feet on a golf ball, something, uh, you know, be barefoot, stimulate the feet, spread your toes, balance on one leg so that you can avoid going to the podiatrist because you actually have plantar fasciitis, as an example. Wow. Why is it that so many of us don't focus on our feet? We don't. They're just hidden in our shoes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I read, um, I read a comment from a doctor who said that shoes are foot coffins. And I was like, I've never heard that before. A coffin, your foot's in the coffin. He's saying that because you re it's so restrictive, you can't move your feet. Is that why he's saying that? Yeah, most traditional footwear is very restrictive. People think about shoes as 
comfort. So comfort. they want support. They want cushion. Uh, if you're familiar with like Hoka's or Skechers, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of these brands have, you know, all that thick cushion and a memory foam arch support. And to someone, especially in New York, and you're walking around and you're like, oh, my feet. And then you see an ad for this supportive cushion to memory foam shoe. You're just yeah. like, yes, that's like a, a comfortable mattress that I would be sleeping <laughs> on, right? Yeah. So that's what people yeah. often associate. But people don't realize that all of that support and cushion is actually weakening and disconnecting the foot. Really? Really? So what can we do? I mean, how do we know when we get uh, purchasing the proper shoes for our feet? How do we know what's, what's proper for us? Yes. Yeah, so this is where I try to educate via podcasts such as yours. I write blogs. I wrote my book, Barefoot Strong, so that people can go into, let's say, a shoe store, educated, because shoe stores want to sell shoes and yes. typically the more expensive shoes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Right? So they may recommend off of a very traditional mindset of how we recommend shoes. Typically, if you go into a shoe store, they're going to say, okay, you need, if you have flat feet, you need motion control. If you have high arches, you need support, right? The, the shock absorbing cushion one, yes. right? And then if you're neutral, you'll kind of be in the middle, right? So they kind of categorize people into these three buckets. Yes. Whereas there's actually this category of footwear that is more flexible, um, more minimal is what they call it, barefoot, natural, right. zero drop. And they're shoes that you can kind of rotate and fold and twist. They don't have a lot of cushion in them. They don't have support. Hmm. That footwear, worn appropriately, can actually strengthen the feet. Oh. Now, what I recommend is if you normally wear lots of cushion and support hmm. and you are intrigued to go into the more flexible, minimal barefoot shoe, you want to transition slowly so you don't want to go from one to the other and then walk 10 miles and then now you have plantar fasciitis right yes. <laughs> so we want to make sure we transition slowly and as you transition you are releasing your feet every single day you're massaging them stand on a golf ball lacrosse ball just something to try to offset the stress of transitioning to minimal shoes right right now, I see a lot of orthod or what, what they call it, orthotics, ortho or they call that insert those sole insoles for your feet. Yep. That's a, that's a big industry today. But so many of us are having foot issues. How do we take care of our feet? So you, here's the first one, is understanding your foot type. That's what I would say. Oh, really? And I have online, I, I mentioned it in my <clears throat> book. If you go to barefootstrong.com, barefootstrong.com, there is a foot type quiz. And you can go oh. on there and you can determine your foot type. So now, if you have a flatter foot, a flat foot, or a pronated kind of collapsing foot, that is one that you want to think about strength. How do you build strength? In that foot okay i teach exercises on foot strengthening one is called short foot short foot you essentially just push your toes into the ground right and you can do it when you stand you can stand on one leg and then push your toes into the ground that is activating short foot okay um, there's also something that's called a forward lean where you could stand with your feet shoulder width apart and you literally just start to lean your body forward and really? your toes will push into the ground huh. and it activates your foot. Really? Uh, so these are some initial ways to start doing it. Um, classes like Pilates and yeah. yoga are good. very good for strengthening the feet. Yeah. That's where I start to push the flat foot over pronation. Okay. On the other side, we have a high arch or what's called supinated. So you're in the opposite direction. This is a foot that you want to focus on mobility. It's Oof. too tight. We need to release it. Yes. And that releasing would be the bottom of the foot, your calves, so all the lower leg muscles. So these muscles of your lower leg, you want to 
either stretch them or roll them, massage them, use a foam roller, right? Yes. And Ooh. once you balance out either stability or mobility in the foot based off of the foot type, then I like to make sure that your foot is talking to your core and everybody's feet is connected to your abs and to your glutes, to your, ah. hip, your pelvis, right? Yes. So strong Ooh. feet yes. means strong core, okay? If someone has does not have a strong core and they're trying to strengthen their feet, they need to look at both. So for, for many of my patients, I will actually give them core exercises while I give them foot exercises. And initially they used to be surprised and be like, you are a foot doctor. Why are you up in my pelvis? <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. you're, down, you're down there, yes. but they're so connected. This is why I, I love Pilates. And a great way for people to start to do Pilates is if you don't have a, a membership at a gym or go to classes in like a Pilates studio, you can always go to YouTube and find Pilates classes, right? That are free. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. gonna, yes. Right. And then just start to do the exercises that help you to connect to your core and then connect to your feet. And then can you connect your feet to your core? That's my wow. goal. Your feet to your core. Now, again, I've never really heard that before. I had no idea that, because I talk about flattened stomach, six pack abs, all that good stuff. I never talk about strong feet and, and six pack abs. You know what I'm saying? I never make that connection. That is amazing. So we need to now start talking about how strong is your feet, <laughs> right? 100%. 100%. Yep. Unbelievable. And I will actually tell people, I will say, that your core is only as strong as your feet are stable, right? So we want that. And then to take it even further, your glutes, everyone wants nice glutes, strong glutes, right? Your glutes are only as strong as your core is stable. So now we have this connection. So if you want, you know, the six pack abs, you really should be strengthening your feet. If you want a nice, tight, strong glute or backside, yes. you need strong, stable core. So when people understand that connection of the body, it really takes fitness and training to a different level. Yes. And it, it makes it much more integrated versus, okay, I'm doing my crunches. And then I'm going to do my bicep curl. Like they start to realize this integration of the human body that when you start to integrate exercises, you're so much stronger. Most definitely. Sounds great. I'm going to have to make sure I make a point of that. That's great information <laughs> to know. I think I'm going to put this section at the very beginning of the uh, podcast. <laughs> yeah, <there you> <laughs> Listen, if someone is obese or overweight, does that affect their feet? Well, yes. Yeah. So this is actually something really interesting is when I was in podiatry school at NYCPM, we actually used to go into the schools in um, Harlem, East Harlem, and we would do foot screens on the children because there's research that shows that if you have flat feet, pronated feet, mm -hmm. there is a correlation to decreased activity because flat feet are tired feet, okay? Huh. So if you have a child that is, doesn't like doing gym class, right? Maybe they like are a little clumsy and they trip a lot or they just, it's a lot of work to move when you have flat feet that are tired feet, yes. then you're not going to move. So what, what we were doing was we were essentially trying to screen children, get them orthotics as part of the school system, get them orthotics to support the feet so that they would feel more stable and then they would increase their activity. And this was a, a program to prevent childhood diabetes. So hmm. that correlation is really important. So then that's where you could say, yes, if an adult, not a child, but an adult also has flat feet, weak feet, tired feet, hmm. it's a lot of work to move. You're not gonna move if it's a lot of work. So then that's going to contribute to increased weight gain and some of the diabetes and the obesity of what you're referencing, 
Huh. So maybe you have a new, I come across some of these clients, uh, we should ask them about their feet. <laughs> yeah. And, and if any of the listeners are saying like, I'm having a hard time losing weight or, you know, weight loss is my fitness goal, right? Let's say that's their goal. Right. And they've never looked at their feet. They don't, they never thought of their foot in any way. And they're listening to this and they say, oh, oh my gosh, my feet are totally pronating. Maybe that's why I get tired easily. That's why I can only walk so far. And then maybe my feet start to get tired or they hurt. And then it's hard for me to lose weight or stay on like a walking fit program because my feet are what's limiting me and my ability to walk to lose weight, let's say, right? That's, this is very common. I see this all the time. And patients used to come into my office and just sit down and be like, Dr. Spickle, I am exhausted. Isn't it because of my feet, right? Like they're physically exhausted. And I would look at their feet, totally collapse. And I'd be like, 100%, this makes sense, right? You either need to get an orthotics or strengthen your feet, or maybe both, maybe right? Both. Depending on the foot. Right. And when it comes to strengthening your feet, you recommend, again, certain exercises to do that. Right. Yep. Yep. And uh, what are the what are some of the best exercises to do to strengthen your feet? You know, again, this is it's you. I, I have tons of videos online about you know short foot balancing, forward lean, things like that. I am always a fan that when you are new to doing these exercises, to weave it into a class that already exists. Um, Again, Pilates, yoga, some people are like, I don't do yoga because <laughs> that, that's a lot of flexibility. Um, but I actually have some online workouts on YouTube. If you look up the workout bear, so B-A-R, bear workout, you will see these free workouts that I have on the internet that are barefoot balance training based. So barefoot balance training. Okay. It's my way to strengthen the feet, the core and the glutes for people. Nice. Um, and it, that combination, another great way would be is if you work out and you do your squats, you work with your trainer or they're working with you is just take your shoes off, work out without shoes. Right. right? And it forces you to start to think about your feet, maybe mm -hmm. engage your feet. Definitely. Definitely. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I know you are the creator of the barefoot training specialist certification program. And what is it about working out barefoot that's kind of like taken off more and more people I find are doing it considering it and I'm hearing more and more about it why is that so powerful and and uh, beneficial so there's two two ways that you can think about it or two kind of buckets or columns first one is going to be more mechanical and what that means is that when we are in shoes with cushion and maybe some drop right and rigidity you restrict the natural flexibility and range of motion of the foot. Okay. Right. So by getting out of the shoes, you now tap into all of your natural range of motion within the foot and the ankle. That is ideal when you are doing fitness because you are trying to connect to your body, right? Move your body to its potential. So that's one way. Second way is that all that cushion in that shoe blocks the skin in the bottom of the feet and the skin in the bottom of the feet has many nerves, nerves that are designed to read the ground, to feel the ground, to engage and connect with the ground. In shoes, you can't do that. So taking off your shoes gets you natural range of motion, and it gets you actually feeling your feet, feeling the ground. And when I can feel my feet and I can feel the ground, I'm going to squat differently. I'm going to do a lunge differently, right? So whatever exercise I do, my articulation or my engagement is going to be different. Wow, that's interesting. And so I know when some people, let's see guys do squats, they'll put something underneath their heel, their feet, and they'll squat down. But you're saying that's not necessarily good for your feet or for your body. Right, so I would argue Mm -hmm. Instead of doing that is to try to get the natural range of motion, right? So could you do myofascial work and release the calves so that you have the range of motion and you don't have to cheat by putting something under the heels, mm -hmm. right? Now, 
is there a mechanical advantage or reason for doing that? Yes, mm -hmm. if you're trying to lift heavier. So this is where like Olympic lifting shoes, if you've seen like Ollie's shoes, right? They actually have a drop to them. They're almost like, a not a high heel, but you know what I mean? Like a yeah, little yeah, lift. Yeah. And the reason why they do that is to get high enough potentiation of your muscles, you have to go deeper into a squat. So you have to like drop the butt really low, right? Right. In order to do that, the, I'll just say in the case Olympic lifting, the Olympic lifter has to be able to kind of cheat the ankle to drop the butt low enough. And that's why they have Olympic lifting shoes the way that they are. People, of course, take that into mainstream and they'll put little plates under the heels and squat. Right. Right. I get it. Just makes you do it both ways. Yeah. Don't always do squats with your heels up. Do it both ways. Yeah. 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 But bare, but barefoot training, and do you recommend doing that actually inside of the gym? You know, there's weights there, there's other equipment there. I'm thinking about, you know, I'm thinking about a gym where there's other people. Is that yeah. really that that makes sense? Can, can you do that and not injure yourself? Yes. So I actually, when I was living in New York, I lectured a lot at Equinox and like pounded the door down of train without shoes, train without shoes, train without shoes, right? Like get into this natural uh, range of motion. And they actually changed their policy that you could be on the gym floor in socks. So yeah. not totally barefoot, right, but we right, got closer. Right. We got closer. So they actually approved that you could train without shoes on. Same thing at Crunch is I kept pushing and I worked for Crunch for uh, 20 years and um, kept pounding the door down, pounding the door down that you would actually see and they would allow people to train in socks. So they would wear the slides, like the Adidas slide or something like that with the yeah. socks on. And then they would yes. walk around in the sandals, get to where they were going to lift the weights or do their squats, kick them off, be in their socks, do the squat, and then kind of put their, their slides back on. Um, so yeah, obviously be smart. If someone yes. is throwing the dumbbells or the kettlebells around, don't go by them. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want it to drop on your foot. Yes, yes. What about outside? Have you seen people wear, you know, go outside uh, barefoot as well for that same reason, because they want to be closer to the earth? 100%. And here's another fun bonus is that if you go barefoot outside on the earth, that is yes. called grounding or earthing, which means that you can connect to the natural energy of the earth. That's what I'll say. Really, it's the polarity. Uh, I don't want the listeners to be like, what? This <laughs> girl just went over to the other <laughs> side. <laughs> oh, no. But um, we, we age from inflammation. I had said that earlier, right? We age from acidity. So you could think of that like a positive charge. The earth has a natural negative charge to it. We are magnets, right? Yes, so when you earth, you are essentially canceling out or balancing out the positive of the inflammation in the body. So that's where people from like a holistic approach will say that grounding and earthing is very healthy for you yes. because it combats some of that acidity. It also is very good for circulation, circulation to the feet. And it also helps you to match the circadian rhythm of where you are. So a lot of people will say when you travel or you fly like a significant difference in your different time zones to then earth or ground and get onto the circadian rhythm of where you are now at, like the new country or, or whatnot. Right, right. So yeah. for most of us, we're not going to go out and say, okay, I'm going to go out to the gym. I'm going to walk barefoot. I'm going to go outside, walk barefoot. But could we do, could we do um, at home? Could we walk around barefoot at home? Yeah. And then you go out and put your shoes on, do whatever you got to do. But it's a little something better than nothing is what I'm trying to say. Yes. So I recommend at least 30 minutes of barefoot stimulation every day, 30 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that 30 minutes can be walking around your home, right? Mm -hmm. You actually have great floors in your home because the wood floors vibrate and they give a lot of sensory information to the feet and to the nervous system. Yes. So I absolutely love that. Where I now live in Arizona, where it's very hot, yes, everyone has marble and tile. 
So the flooring is very different in homes in Arizona versus homes in like New York City, where it's going to be the wood floors. Yes, yes. All right, so you recommend that walk around for 30 minutes uh, because I'm going to start doing that. Yes. Do 30 minutes of barefoot walking. In fact, even if it's in the morning when I get up, whatever it is. 100%. I'm going to do that. And the benefits from doing that is going to be what? Is you waking up the nerves in the bottom of the feet when you walk and you feel impact forces? The impact forces are stimulating to the muscles in the feet. So you actually strengthen the muscles of the feet when you walk on surfaces such as wood that vibrate and give you information. 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 Yeah, like stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, not inflammation, but inflammation, right? <laughs> info. Yeah, info. <laughs> that, is yes. so, that is so cool. Now, I know you're the, you're the CEO of Nuboso. Now, let's talk about that and what your company is doing to make a difference and an impact in a society with your your expertise. That you have. Yes. So I launched Naboso four years ago, and we are a sensory product line. I'll show you one of our, our products. So this is our insole. Our insole is, again, one of our products. We also have socks, mats, uh, release tools. We have a neural ball. We have flooring. All of these products are designed, same pattern, same pattern, to nice. stimulate the nerves in the bottom of the feet. Now, what I had started explaining before about all those nerves in the bottom of the feet that are designed to read the surfaces that we stand on, it's why I recommend going barefoot in your home for 30 minutes is to connect to these nerves. When you use any of the Naboso products with these little pyramids across the entire surface, you are stimulating those nerves. Now, the best analogy of what our products do is like Braille. So Braille dots or the pattern of Braille is stimulating a specific nerve on your finger when you read it. And that nerve is the same nerve in the feet that we stimulate with the Naboso products. So you could think of Naboso as Braille for your feet. Oh, it is wow. waking up the nerves. When you wake up the nerves, you wake up the muscles. When you wake up the muscles, you start to strengthen the foot. You improve balance. You improve uh, energy and endurance, posture. So all of the components of healthy movement is built in the ability to connect to your feet. Wow, that is nice. Now, do you have to go barefoot when you're using the Naboso product? So to get maximum stimulation, yes. skin to surface contact is what you want. Skin. Now, some people will wear thin socks right. and that's fine, right? But we do say, you know, when you do get any of the Naboso products, we recommend going initially no socks. So you get that true maximal experience. Wow. And then if you decide to wear socks, you know, that's your decision, but we recommend thin socks again. Wow. And the company is located where? So we ship out of Arizona, out of Phoenix, Arizona, and our website is naboso.com, N-A-B-O-S-O.com. Our products are on Amazon as well. Uh, we do have some resellers uh, kind of around the U.S., actually around the world. Uh, we have some that are based in New York. Uh, Gnosis is a physical therapy center, 23rd and 7th, and they sell our products. Yeah. And you've only been around four years so far. Four years. Well, it's a relatively young company, right? Relatively. Yeah, four years sounds old, but that's young in company. It is. Oh, most yeah. definitely. <laughs> and you ship worldwide, is that correct? We do, yeah. We have distribution all around the world. Uh, and really one of the most powerful categories that we're in is the medical space. What we do for the medical space with our products is think of someone who might not be able to feel their feet because of neuropathy or they had a stroke, they have an MS, Parkinson's, things like that. If you use our products under a foot that has decreased sensation, we say it's almost like turning the volume up to the noise of the foot so that people can feel their feet again. So we actually have many pilot studies. We're doing various research studies now with different types of neuropathy to help people feel their feet again even though they say otherwise their feet are numb, they can't feel their feet, they have decreased balance. We're using our products to help people feel their feet again, improve their balance, reduce their falls, 
improve their independence because now they feel confident to walk again. And that's a really important part of Naboso and what we do. It's amazing. Where do you see Naboso in the next five years? Uh, I would love to see that we are going through this FDA process. So our insoles and our socks are going through the FDA. Oh, that okay. if those can be picked up and approved by the FDA and the insurance companies, I want to make our products more accessible to certain medical conditions that they don't have to, you know, put the cost out themselves. The insurance will cover it. That's a really important part of our growth. Yeah. Is, is that aspect. Um, and then we have some new products that we're developing that are in more the consumer space yeah. that are trying to make um, balance and foot training. We have some different socks that we're developing, other release tools to just further expand the public awareness of feet yeah. and feet as it connects to the brain, like the nervous mm. system. Um, I consider our feet the gateway into our nervous system, into our brain. Yeah. The more that we can feel our feet, it literally does so much for the brain, just from emotion, intelligence, cognition, mm. movement. It's, it's really powerful. That's very powerful. And it's, and it's huge, especially if you can show that those benefits. I mean, that's what, it, that's what that really is amazing. And getting the FDA approval is important. Right to your company, but uh, and you have a lot of testimonials, I would imagine too. We have many, yeah. So if people are curious, I tell people like, you know, don't listen to me. I I share and will communicate those testimonials to anyone who calls or is uh, curious about our products. But I tell people go to our website um, again, naboso.com. Under every product, you will see dozens and dozens of testimonials where someone may say. I have neuropathy. This is my experience with the product. And it's a genuine uh, experience that people are able to read. Um, they trust it. I want people to trust our products. Nice. So trust and transparency and honesty and education and empowerment. Those are the values of Naboso. Those are my personal values as well, is I want people to feel confident in a product that they are new to learning about so that they can, you know, feel confident to try it because it can, it can really change someone's life if they can connect to their feet again. Huh. And I want them to feel confident trying our products. I believe that. That's amazing. That, that really truly is. And now if someone wanted to contact you directly, I know you're in Arizona. How can they do that? <laughs> so I'm on Instagram. That's probably one of the easiest ways to engage with me. My Instagram handle is dremilydpm. So again, Dr. Emily DPM on Instagram. My podiatry page is my name. So dremilysplickle.com. Yes. Um, I will make sure I send you that URL. And then I have many different websites that um, bring out that education. Barefoot Strong was one of them. Uh, my book Barefoot Strong is on Amazon. And then uh, my YouTube, if someone just went to YouTube and typed in Dr. Emily Feet, you huh. will get hundreds of videos of really? um, really? education and exercises. I try to make some of them shorter, a little bit, you know, more advanced knowledge just to like kind of feed people in a variety of ways. Wow. Wow. And do you do virtual consultations? hundred percent. Yep. Yep. So I have my license is in New York and Arizona, but I see patients all around the world through wow. telemedicine so they can set that up on my website. And then in person, obviously, I'm in Arizona. Wow. How do you manage your time? I'm just throwing this uh, back one out. How do you manage your time? It's amazing. Very, very efficiently. Yeah. I uh, have to be extremely streamlined in my schedule because I am going from podcasts to patients to CEO stuff to wow. uh, yes. writing and lecturing. But I love what I do and I love to hear the feedback that people share of how it helps them. So if any of the listeners try anything, please share with me how it how it helped you. Oh, most definitely. Again, not to take much of your time, but this has been amazing. You've given so much value to my podcast, to my listeners. And uh, I can't, can't wait to share this information, Dr. Smith. Let me say on behalf of my organization, Body Scope of New York, and my Six Weeks of Fitness podcast, I truly want to thank you for coming on this show today. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Oh, man. To my listeners, 
and my viewers. I hope this program was encouraging and informative and inspiring. I know it informed, gave me a lot of information and inspired me. And I hope you continue to tuning in to my Six Weeks of Fitness podcast. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please leave them in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And remember, we don't stop exercising because we grow old. We grow old because we stop exercising. Right, Dr. Emily? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs>